the dawn of modern war. It's hardly a happy birthday, but it's one that can't be overlooked. A century ago this year, the First World War began. The Great War, but great only in its scale of catastrophe. Well over 700,000 British soldiers died in the bloodbath that followed. I don't have a head for numbers. That statistic is incomprehensible. It's about human beings, people who existed, who lived and breathed just as we do. And at the very least, our memory of them should be kept alive. So to remember, and to commemorate, here are seven stories and seven poems about people who fought and worked and grieved and, and wept. And about people who, who made it through, some who tunneled right under the feet of the war and came home and survived. Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen, Ivor Gurney, Robert Graves. I never fail to be affected and moved by their poems, especially those that reflect directly on the horror and brutality of the First World War and drag the reader with them through the barbed wire and mud. But a hundred years have passed now, and as a poet, I feel bound by duty or tradition to take the opportunity to reflect again on that catastrophic loss of life and to think about how we commemorate the dead for the next hundred years and to lay my own wreath at the foot of the cenotaph in the form of images and words. The little town of Etretat in Normandy sits beside the sea. When I think of the Western Front, the English Channel isn't the first thing that springs to mind. But for one woman, it was a source of solace throughout the fighting. Edie Appleton was a professionally trained nurse who kept a diary all the way through the war. She has a unique perspective, behind the scenes, mopping up the human mess. One part of the diary that I always find truly upsetting is Edie's chronicling of the demise of a young man, a rifleman, James Lennox from Ballymena. He's got a piece of shrapnel in his left lung, and even though he can hardly breathe, he clings on to life for six weeks during the stifling French summer of 1916. And Edie's descriptions of his slow and painful death are counterpointed with sublime swims in the sea. August 8th, poor Lennox really seems to be chained to earth. He is so utterly weak that even to turn his head is hard work. I wrote to his mother and fiance for him again yesterday and wanted him to tell me his own words. But all he said was, I don't know what there is you could say. August 12th. It is 31 days since Lennox came in, and he is still not able to get away. The last two days and nights have been sultry, and I have been glad of my morning dip to cool me down. August 23rd. Lennox died soon after 8 o'clock last night. Never have I seen such a slow, painful death. It was as if the boy was chained to earth for punishment. Towards the end, it was agony for him to draw his little gasping breaths, and I felt I must clamp my hand over his nose and mouth and quench the flickering flame. I am very glad for the boy to be away. Why do you think she kept a diary? 
it, it's interesting. The diaries appear to be addressed to her mother, and this is always something I've rather struggled with because my instinct would be, well, would you write home to your mum saying, dear mother, you know, and then gory, seriously gory details about what she was dealing with. I think it was all part of that business of keeping um, herself solid and grounded and possibly also sharing with the family back home, sharing what was going on for her. When you knew Edie as a younger boy, you wouldn't have known anything of these diaries, so did it make you see Edie in a new light when you came to read her oh, diaries? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I knew her as in her 60s, 70s. Um, she died aged about 80, um, you know, when she's writing the diaries to start with. She's a younger woman, she's 37. So it's a, it's a completely different person, and it's, it's hard to, for me to match the two, and I'm really pleased to be able to match the two. Edie's diaries are full not just of words, but of drawings. I'm really taken by her sketches of the sea here at Etretat. A regular swimmer, she loves to leave the carnage behind and find calm in its regular tides. My favourite drawing is that one mm. in the bottom right there. It's the evening at Etretat, those rocks again, but Venus up in the sky and the, the light that it leaves on the water coming towards her. She writes in her diary, last night was a joy, the moon well up in the east and Venus some distance in the west, sea like a mill pond and everything flooded in moonshine. Venus made a little path of shine across the sea. I should like to have stayed out instead of stuffing off to bed after all. <laughs> Edie's nursing duties seemed to ebb and flow with the action of the war. On the 1st of July, 1916, as the Somme offensive begins, things are eerily quiet for her at the hospital. And then suddenly, wounded, hundreds upon hundreds on stretchers, being carried, walking, all covered from head to foot in well-caked mud. Horribly bad wounds, some crawling with maggots, some stinking and tense with gangrene. One poor lad had both eyes shot through, and there they were, all smashed and mixed up with the eyelashes. He was quite calm and very tired. He said, shall I need an operation? I can't see anything. Poor boy, you never will. There are regular moments through the diary of real tenderness mm. and acts of, 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 of great tenderness. She talks about giving somebody a handkerchief yes. that it always seems to do the trick for people who are dying, that it yes. seems to bring some sort of comfort to them, doesn't she? And she does, yes. Uh, and um, one lad who says, will you, will you kiss me when I've gone? And mm. then... Um, <laughs> It makes me choke talking about it. But she says, you know, and I did kiss him once for his mum and once for myself. Mm. <laughs> and that's well beyond the call of duty, I guess, isn't it? I don't think she would have thought it was. I'm sure she would have known what was needed, you know, and it would have come from her heart. Dear mother, I've come to the sea to wash my eyes in its purples, blues, indigos, greens, to enter its world and emerge cleansed, to break the surface, then watch the surface heal and mend. Behind me, the land lies mauled and wrenched, but I have not flinched from uncommon holes in the flesh of men, or heads oozing with shattered minds, and have not shied from livers and lungs exposed to the light, and have balanced and carried faltering hearts in my cupped hands through the egg and spoon race of death and life. Some men I kissed, Boy soldiers, raving and blind, begging for love from a mother's lips. And when death stands with its black shawl at the foot of the bed, a white cotton handkerchief eases the soul. 
So allow me the beach, the sea, its handwritten waves, the act of making a simple sketch of a simple catch, or stick figures plunging into the depths, or a cormorant bearing its breast to the sun, or at dusk, Venus robed in her wedding dress, her silver train like a path on the water heading west. In Oxford, just three days after war was declared, a modest, middle-class lad who also happened to have one of the best brains of his generation signed his life away to Kitchener's army. A classicist and a fellow of New College, Oxford, Arthur Heath won scholarship after scholarship and prize after prize, but he wanted his knowledge to have meaning in the real world. So he taught the working classes as part of the Workers' Educational Association and served on the Oxford Board of Guardians, trying to solve problems of poverty. He wasn't a, a raiser of fists or a banger of tables, but he was genuinely interested in the construction of a new kind of society. And then along came the war. Arthur spent his last nights in Oxford grappling with the idea of conflict and playing on his piano the French, Hungarian and German music he loved. A year later on the Western Front, the now Lieutenant Heath played Chopin to his fellow officers in their mess. Two months after that, on his 28th birthday, he was dead. After his death, Arthur's family published his correspondence. Amazingly, uh, I found this flimsy little handwritten letter in my unbound copy, and it's from Arthur's mother to an acquaintance of hers, saying that she's sending some of my dear boy's letters, and she thinks that some of them will interest you. It's quite an understatement, actually, because the letters are full of power and poignancy. The average life expectancy of a British junior officer on the Western Front was just six weeks. But in one extraordinary letter, Arthur seeks to reassure his mother that he isn't scared of dying because, through art, he has truly lived. This was a letter written to Arthur's mother on the 11th of July, 1915. We make the division between life and death as if it were one of dates, being born at one date and dying some years after. But just as we sleep half our lives, so when we're awake too, we know that often we're only half alive. Life, in fact, is a quality rather than a quantity. The first time I ever heard Brahms's Requiem remains with me as an instance of what I mean. Now, if such moments could be preserved and the rest strained off, None of us could wish for anything better. And just as these moments of joy or elevation may fill our own lives, so too they may be prolonged in the experience of our friends, and exercising their power in those lives may know a continual resurrection. I mean, I, I find it um, sort of brave beyond logic, really. I. I can't imagine that if I was staring down the barrel of a gun or, you know, looking at the point of a bayonet, I would find such, you know, philosophical consolation. But I, I think I understand what he's saying, that, you know, there are times when in a poem or listening to music or in any kind of art, you, you feel as if you've you've had a glimpse of the eternal, you know, you've experienced a, a little bit of, of heaven on earth. And that if you can associate those moments with um, people who you've lost, loved ones, then 
you know, just, just through the elation and the ecstasy.